What's up, traders? Welcome to this week's episode of the Weekly Watchlist, where I do a technical analysis and give you my thoughts on the tickers listed up above. We'll of course be checking in on the broad market. After that, we've got our core list of companies. And if you stick with me towards the end of the video, I've got three additional trade ideas to share with you. So definitely stay tuned for that. A couple of quick announcements here. The first one is that the market will be closed on Monday in observance of Juneteenth. Announcement number two, perhaps the more important one, that for the 25,000 subscriber mark here on YouTube, we're not there yet, but pretty darn close. We want to make some shirts up for the community. Two ways to vote or indicate your interest. Number one would be in the YouTube poll that's active underneath the community tab. Or number two is to go into the Discord room for the shirt poll and vote both on the sizing distribution as well as the t-shirt design. That way we can order enough for everyone who wants one. No biggie if you're not interested. Last but not least, as always, anything that we are associated with is linked down below in the description. And without further ado, let's jump right into these charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this week, we certainly have a bearish, solid-bodied red candle with minimal upper and lower wicks. The reason I even bring those up is just to indicate that there was a flurry of volatility at the highs and a little flurry of volatility at the lows. But nonetheless, if we look at where the week closed, obviously it's dead in the lower third of the weekly range. So without a doubt, structure has to go to the bears for this week's session. When we start thinking about location though, this is where things start to get pretty interesting in my estimation, noting that we did form a weekly gap. Weekly gaps are fairly rare, they don't happen often, and they are something to carry forward as an important area of a lack of structure, okay? So we'll talk about those actual numbers as we drill down to the daily time frame in just a moment. Obviously on a bar by bar perspective, that did form a significant lower high and a significant lower low here. And the reason we wanna read into this especially is because if we think about trends and what constitutes trend reversal, or trend continuations, we have a couple of things in place here. Number one is that our lower highs have been continuing. So number one, lower highs continuing, that keeps the downtrend in effect. And we have lows, lower lows, and now again, another lower low here, which also keeps the downtrend in force. To reverse this, we would now need two things, or one of the two things, right? Either a higher high, meaning taking out this up here, closer to that 415 level, I don't think that's likely on the upcoming week's worth of trade, or a higher low. And even if we do form a higher low here, we're not technically out of the woods until we breach that higher high to confirm Firm the new uptrend, right? So overall, uh, a lot of damage was done on the Monday gap down this week. And we'll see that in the sector charts as well, as we continue to sort of filter through today's analysis. So from a location perspective, obviously 100% going to the bears in the past week's worth of trade. The other thing I would point out before we start looking at the high volume nodes on a volume by price perspective is that volume and the amount of activity in the marketplace as we've been selling off has increased here as opposed to decreased. Okay, so the selling is certainly real and it is coming in hot and heavy. Let's take a quick peek at our volume profile and see what we have to potentially quote unquote catch us underneath. So as we were mentioning in last week's video, we were sitting right at a high volume node. Would it offer some support was the question. Obviously gapping down underneath it sort of negated that as a possibility at all right early on in the week. So the next area we looked at was around in here around that uh, 371. That was a daily level that we picked out. But after that, remember we talked all about this area right here, which well, not unfortunately if you're a bear, but unfortunately if you're a bull, is way down below at 335, right? So as we open up this week, if we open kind of here, comparable to the close of the prior week's worth of trade, and again, remember the market is closed on Monday, we're kind of opening right in this low volume node. And remembering that markets like to move from high volume node to high volume node, again, there's nothing saying that we can't kind of travel through this area fairly quickly. Now, don't get me wrong, a 30 point move here in the SPY would be, I don't want to say unheard of, but it's sort of outside the norm of what a weekly uh, sort of expected range would look like. So be prepared, buckle up for some continued serious volatility in this marketplace. I think we'll find that is the same sort of case or at least line of thinking. Again, prepare for more volatility as we take a peek at the VIX and the VVIX as we move through today's analysis. So with that being said, weekly timeframe, every, obviously everything about this
this uh, is still in a clear downtrend and pointing in the bearish direction. It's not like we're sitting on major weekly support as of right now. Let's drill down to the daily time frame and start talking about the uh, sort of nuanced levels, if you will. So bear with me as I load up the study set, 50 in blue, 200 SMA in green, and there we go with our levels. So that weekly gap that we were just discussing on the weekly time frame, how fitting, right, is going to be from here. This is going to be 383.99, call it 384 if you like nice round numbers, up to the low of last Friday, or excuse me, two Fridays ago now, at 389.75. This is the gap that did not fill and should be carried forward as, uh, you know, really important because it's a weekly gap as well. So what happened this week? We certainly got into the gap a little bit here on the Wednesday session while we got that FOMC volatility, but all of that was taken back. If you watched the Wednesday video, we talked about the real concern behind the fact that, again, buyers got into the gap, but they did not do what they should have done, which was fill that weekly gap overhead. So really, no one is willing to sort of put their neck out there first and turn into the new money buyers trying to, quote unquote, catch a bottom here in this marketplace. And it would seem the same on the Friday session, the fact that we really just consolidated inside of that prior bar well below the edge of the weekly expected move, right? Look at what happened here. And we also know that this close right here was also well outside of the weekly expected move range from the week prior to that. So all of these moves underneath the prior edge of the weekly expected move start to become concerning, noting that, again, uh, the buyers should see this as extended, right? The market's really getting it wrong here, and the buyers are not stepping up at all, as we just sort of outlined based on the failure to get back inside of the range here on that FOMC volatility. And obviously, we went lower to close out the week. For the upcoming week's expected move, you will notice that the top end is underneath the top of that weekly gap, which is, again, another reason why I don't think it's very likely that the market makes a new significant higher high or higher low or anything that really changes the weekly trend as of right now. That level is just shy of our 380.57, which was also the swing low from right around in here. So on the upside, if for some reason we finally get a little bit of a reprieve bounce off of this really harsh selling, then that would be an area where I would start to say, okay, probably don't want to see the market much higher than this. Uh, and there's possibility for looking out for short entries at that sort of area around 380 and the top end of the weekly expected move. Now to the downside, the low end is going to be in here around 352.25. I'll just back out real quick a couple of years here and show you where that support is coming from. It is well above that 335 um, high volume node that we had pointed out, which is really uh, midway through here, right? It's kind of right around in this area, slightly underneath. You get the gist, but that 352.25, which is fairly close to the low end of the weekly expected move, is coming from prior resistance, resistance, break, retest, and it held. And that's where we sort of kicked off that next rally from. So 352.25 is what we have. Have underneath us for uh, support early on in the week. It is a shortened trading week, but again, with the volatility out there, who knows if we're going to smash the bottom end. We will, of course, give you an update on the Wednesday session if we breach that, and we'll start looking out for next supports underneath. So everything about the chart here is definitely falling into the bear category, noting that the response from the buyers, right, uh, you know, just was not there whatsoever over the past week's worth of trade here. If we take out the fibs, let's say that this is going to be the quote unquote bottom right here. I don't think it's a healthy bottom from a structural perspective. We'll see that on the market profile in just a moment. But if we take out the fibs and say, you know, let's just pretend that we know the market's going to bounce early on. Notice again, your 38.2 Fibonacci, which technically keeps things in bear flag consolidation, is aligned with that resistant area up here around 380 that we were talking about just a minute ago. So everything here on the daily time frame and the weekly time frame certainly fall into the bearish category. Let's take a peek behind the curtain now and start getting into some S&P sectors here. What's going on in the XLC? I'm going to drop this back down uh, to a one-year chart so we're not looking at so much data but in the XLC, you can clearly see, uh, remember that this no, C, I just said that a couple times, right? No pun intended. But nonetheless, you can see that we are underneath the bottom end of the prior balance. And on the Wednesday session, we sort of get a break retest and then move back lower into the close of the week. Now, we did form a little bit of support here in 53 was prior support off to the left. So let's see if the market wants to bounce around in here. But nonetheless, remember what we just discussed from a trend analysis perspective on the SPY weekly timeframe, unless we produce a higher high 
or a higher low, it's really just in the category and in the camp of the bears right now. Anything that remains below 56.40 in my estimation is just bear flag consolidation, and the trend would certainly not change if we remain in this zone. And I think we'll find that this will be the case for a majority of our sectors as we move throughout today's video. So XLC in the bear category. XLY, consumer discretionary, also making a new lower low here. Remember what that means. We can afford a dead cat bounce here. Certainly put in some sort of lower high and then continue on our merry way to the downside. Now, one of our concerns in the prior week's video was that, you know, we were making this 100% retracement. It's very rare that you just crack this on the first go, right? Well, we got a little bit of a dead cat bounce, filled some of the gap, but remember what that meant for the buyers, right? The buyers were not strong here. They didn't fill the gap and hold it. Instead, it reversed off of that and we're right back down at these lows, making that new lower low. So again, has to fall into the bear category here inside of the XLY. Anything that bounces below this level right here. Let me switch tools and try that one more time. Anything that remains below 143.14 at this point in time it has to be bearish, right? Anything here is bearish. If we do start to take that out, maybe there's a possibility for a higher low reversal, but until that actually happens, we need to carry forward that the structure in these charts is in fact bearish. XLK, perhaps the most important sector of them all, the tech sector here. Again, Here's your 100% retracement, filled the gap, really weak close on that FOMC day, and now we're getting acceptance underneath. The other interesting thing that's happening here is that on the Friday session, we also fail the two-day balance lows from the Monday and Tuesday session, perhaps best illustrated here on the, um, what is this, the 30-minute time frame, excuse me. You can see here's your lows, right? And notice how we close or try to get some acceptance, then close underneath on the Friday session. So to me, not really a great look. Also note that you're failing that small uptrend that was forming on high volume, obviously market on closed orders going through, but not the best look here on the XLK, which again is perhaps the most important sector for the S&P 500, heaviest by market cap. So two-day balance kind of looking like it might want to favor the breakdown, even though we had a green candle on the Friday session. If it does bounce, again, everything that remains underneath 131 at this point in time keeps it in the bear category. If it takes out 131, a higher low above starts to shift our tone, but until that actually happens, bearish, right? There's no way around it. The XLRE for real estate, just kind of going sideways in a balance down here. Could it turn into a double bottom? Yes. But remember that this is such a lightweight sector that even if it cracks the double bottom highs and fills the gap overhead, it's not really going to do a whole lot in terms of impacting the S&P itself to the upside. And also remember that from here to here, we obviously have very significant new lower lows. So any bounce that fills the gap could easily produce a lower high and we're still in a downtrend, right? XLF up next, again, another important uh, second heaviest weighted sector that we're watching, right? So we're spending some time on this one as well. Notice that again, really no acceptance over the Thursday high on the Friday session, right? This was a pretty solid daily buy setup with a hammer candle forming down here. It was a break of the balance. So if we were to recapture that, you could technically call it a look below and fail. Again, the buyers were nowhere to be found on the Friday session. We technically look back in and then close back underneath. So I'm not overly impressed with the buying activity that's been taking place or lack of buying activity that's really been taking place here inside of the XLF. The chart has to strike me as bearish. And again, for all the same reasons that we've been discussing this week, uh, again, lower low here means even if we come up and fill this gap, that's not, it's not shifting my tone until we get a higher low and then a next higher high above that level right there. We can afford the lower high at this point in time. Anything that's underneath this set of highs in here keeps the downtrend in effect. So please be mindful of our structure here in all of the sectors. Really, the activity that took place, the big lower lows that happened on the Monday gap down were detrimental to to the uh, structure of our S&P sector charts overall. Again, in the short term, could this rally higher? Maybe, but even if it does finally give us, you know, a little bit more acceptance above that 31, I'm just not, uh, I'm not convinced, right? Obviously with that Friday really lackluster buying as well, I don't think that, uh, you know, buyers are just gonna jump in on the shortened trading week on the Tuesday session and send this thing up to fill the gap overhead. Next up, we've got the XLV, the second heaviest weight by market cap, third heaviest weight that we particularly are watching. Notice the massive massive failure on the Friday session. If I just zoom in a little bit more here, you can certainly see the size of this inverted hammer closing almost smack on the open here, really large failed upper wick. So again, think about it from a daily buy setup. You have a hammer candle here. It was actually green instead of the red one we just saw on the XLF, right? We take out the highs. That rally does come, but there's no acceptance in the prior range. It fails into the close and we close red back inside of the green hammer candle. So overall, again, the buying activity is 
it's just simply not there in the marketplace. And remembering the importance of this sector, really not great to see. I would also remind you that from a monthly perspective, here is a balance range, right? And on these little dead cat bounces, we've still failed to even come in for the back test of 125. Structurally speaking, that's incredibly bearish, right? We're not even close to the back test for a break retest and then rollover. The buyers just simply are not there to get it there in the first place. So XLV, pretty concerning. Let's move a little bit faster through some of the less uh, important sectors, uh, not as heavy weight. Unfortunately, the XLB giving us a great daily buy setup with the hammer candle, significant new lower low, right? If it took out that high, fantastic, the trade's on, but XLB materials, and I'm not sure if I said builders early, but this is materials. Um, even if it does take it out, it's such a lightweight sector, it's not going to do a whole lot for the S&P uh, and pushing it back higher. So although the setup's good, uh, not going to do a whole lot for us. XLI, same deal, right? A little bit more indecisive. It's not so much a hammer candle here, but new lower low and then close back sort of at the lows of the prior day's range. Again, it's not as good as what we just saw in the XLB, but nonetheless, if this were to bounce such a lightweight sector that this too isn't really going to do a whole lot for us. And I would imagine that there's probably still some resistance here on the back test of the flush point from the three day balance. So again, none of these charts really strike me as bullish, but even if the uh, lightweight sectors that look good here bounce, not going to help out a ton. XLP, consumer staples, what's happening here? Uh, certainly a little bit more sideways over the Thursday and Friday session and inside bar on the Thursday session. So I would watch to see if this one wants to resolve higher. The reason that I'm not overly convinced that it will is because if you think about the range here, right, we had a two day balance in play. And don't get me wrong, we do still have another two day balance inside bar in play here, but look at where Friday closed, right? Technically, we explored a little bit inside of the first two-day balance on the Friday session, right? There was some time spent above in here, but we closed kind of underneath that level. Again, if it was going to be more bullish and turn into a look below and fail here to here, why did the buyers not show up on the Friday session? It just, you know, they weren't having it, right? The buyers, as we can see through all of these sector charts so far, are just nowhere to be found on the Friday session. And again, in, unless they really want to just come out guns blazing on Monday, uh, Tuesday, excuse me, then I think all this sectors remain in the bear category. The XLU has been beat up to the extent where obviously it's bearish drag for the S&P 500, but I would not be looking for new shorts in the utility sector. I mean, sure, here's your trend line. We're sort of getting through it. I think that, you know, because we're so extended here, we've had no sort of reprieve from the sellers. One day of an inside bar there on the Wednesday session. I just think the risk for a snapback here is too high to be looking for new money shorts dead on the lows. Um, and even if it does bounce again, is it going to help out the S&P 500? Not really. It's too much of a lightweight sector. XLE, really, really important look here. This is something that you need to start paying attention to. Remember that energy is one of the things that we don't want to see leading the charge in any sort of market reversals here. Now, obviously, if the market's just continuing to go lower as a whole, then it doesn't really matter what energy is doing. But the fact that it's coming off of the highs is a good thing, because if the market for some reason were to start to form some sort of more meaningful bottom, this would not be the one leading the charge to the upside. Now, from a structural standpoint, don't get me wrong, it's still uh, in a much more healthy looking trajectory than many other things that we look at in the sector list. Uh, but not leading the charge is, of course, good. Remember, less, uh, you know, the, the lower the cost of energy, the less pressure on the consumer, the better for the market. Okay, so that's what we see in the energy sector. Uh, could it be pricing in things slowing down overall? Again, the recession, people traveling less, um, people tightening up the budgets and not, you know, obviously you have planes and cargo and less spending. Energy is such like an important sector just in terms of how the economy works, right? Is it pricing in a little bit of a slowdown here? Maybe that could also be the case, at least something to consider. So that's been an in-depth look at the sector uh, structure charts themselves. Let's take a quick peek at our ratios Notice the big four actually had upticks on the Friday session. Although everything was bearish, they just weren't down as bad as what we saw in the S&P 500. And I think there's a reason for that, which we'll look at after the ratios. Hint, hint, it has to do with rates coming in a little bit. But the XLK actually ticked higher, right? It still is, don't get me wrong, in this descending triangle with flat lows here. The look is bearish, but we're starting to get acceptance once again, or at least try to, up and over the gold line, which is the 50 simple moving average. And by the way, if you don't know what this chart is or how to set it up, I've got a tutorial tutorial for you in the top right hand corner. After that, though, XLV continuing to bounce and look good here up and over the 50 simple moving average. What else? XLY really just sideways, not continuing to deteriorate. And in the XLF bouncing as well off of these lows. Don't get me wrong. It's still kind of in this box of wickedness, if you will. I would even draw the box in slightly less than that. Something like this. This looked promising in the past. We're still kind of just in the midpoint of that range. We're not yet breaking out of it again to the upside. So XLK kind of the one thing looking promising here. But overall, remember that that we obviously need more than two, so 
We always need more than one, but more than two that are pointing in the upward direction to start to signal more risk on. Obviously, XLV is one of them. XLK starting to perk up here, but not quite there all the way. So unfortunately, risk on is not yet activated. And then down at the very bottom, these are our risk off sectors. Notice that they're all still in, most of them at least, in glaring uptrends. So your XLP still above that 50 SMA. The XLE pulling back aggressively into the upward sloping 50 SMA, but certainly not pointing lower yet or breaching underneath. The XLRE kind of going sideways, starting to perk up a little bit, and then the XLU at an upward sloping 50 SMA. Remember, again, we need more than two to sort of turn off the risk off, and it's currently not the case, but, uh, you know, a majority of these still look fine from the trend perspective. So that's what we've got in the ratio grid. Let's take a quick peek now at the TNX, which is, of course, our 10-year note, and hint, hint, as I was talking about earlier, this is why I believe that the tech sector didn't take as bad of a hit on the Friday session. Notice that rates actually backed off a little bit from these highs that we were making earlier on in the week around 3.5. Now, again, is it still well above here? Yes. And that's still going to mean that we have downward pressure on the um, technology sector. But overall, it's not as bad as it could have been. If Friday's bar looked something like this pushing to the upside, I don't think that the ratio grid would have reversed higher back above that downward sloping uh, 50 SMA. So overall, start to keep and continue to keep an eye on our TNX to see does it hold this level right here? Uh, let's call it uh, 30 3150 in the TNX itself. If it remains above, then obviously it's still kind of a more bearish drag for the XLK. And as we know, this is completely uh, disjointed from any sort of benefit for the financial sector. So don't look for these higher rates to help out the XLF at all at this point in time. So that's been your TNX. Let's take a quick peek at our VIX, which is, of course, the volatility index. What's going on here? So some pretty big concerns. As the market's making new lows, why was the VIX making lower highs? Why was it not making a new high? much closer to that sort of capitulation max fear handle that we have up around 40. Just as a reminder, obviously you can see it falls down from it here and here, but even if we grab more time, something like a three-year chart, there we go. This, of course, is the sickness. Even as we were like sort of peak sickness, peak fear in the market still, uh, that's where we top out, right, around that 40 handle. So as we're getting that aggressive weekly gap down, Monday opened up hideous, right? Why did we not make a new higher high in the VIX above some of these prior reads here around that 35 handle? Kind of interesting. The market's not yet pricing in kind of like a max fear scenario at this point in time. And we can take it one step further. If we take a look at the VVIX, which is volatility of the volatility index, remember that this was kind of uh, recovering here from what seemed like a complete head scratcher underneath that 103. But remember this also, that when the VIX is sort of starting to peak here and people are starting to identify more risk in the marketplace, this wants to get up and over 120. So people are not quite at that, again, max fear and sort of hedging in the VIX itself yet because the VVIX is underneath 120. Okay, so if this were to poke back above, maybe that's your advanced heads up that the VIX is likely gonna see a 40 print and we start to come into more of a capitulation type bottom. As of right now, it just simply doesn't seem the case that we've reached max fear, everyone's throwing in the towel, it's the end of the world. It's just, it, it's not there yet. And that would of course mean that there's potentially lower to go for our marketplace. All right, so that has been the VIX. Let's take a quick peek now at our market internals. If you don't know what these are, I've got another tutorial for you in the top right hand corner as I'm zooming in. You can potentially click on that and check it out. But in the uh, interest of time here, I would say a couple of critical readings that we want to watch here. Everything on the bearish side has been much more magnified than any sort of move back to the upside. If you look at your volume thrusts, big reads, as always, we're looking at sort of negative 300 million mark as a threshold to classify something as significant and positive, obviously, to the upside. All of these have happened and nearly doubled, right? Here's negative 600 million. So I suppose they have doubled to the downside. The outflows are far larger than any of the inflows on the balance days that we've seen in the marketplace. Just strikes me that people aren't flooding back into the market here thinking, okay, we have some sort of bottom in place. The same thing holds true for your advanced decliner. Look at what happens here, way over correlated. And then on the days that are neutral or even slightly up, the FOMC day, kind of just eh, this falls down and kind of just volatile with the FOMC stuff, not too much to read into there. And on Friday, really neutral, right? So all of the bearish reads are magnified and the upside reads are just not there. Simply put in the tick, look at your cumulatives, all of them bearish, neutral, bearish, neutral. 
right? So even on your sort of balance days, these things are not getting in gear to the upside, which once again would indicate that the buyers are just simply nowhere to be found at this point in time. That has been the market internals. The last thing I've got for us on the S&P 500 is our market profile. A couple of interesting things here, poor low, or it's not technically a poor low, poor low happens on a profile, but a mechanical low, the fact that these things are back to back and mechanical high here, the fact that we have highs back to back an overnight high back to back and this as well high from Friday. There's a small amount of gap that remains up in over 37.12, we'll call it, that fills up towards the high of the Wednesday low. That's 37.22, so about a 11-ish point range there to the upside. So be mindful of that. If for some reason the market opens up here on Tuesday and we can breach that, there could be a quick and snappy move outside of the two-day balance here to the upside to close the gap, and then we would, of course, reevaluate the charts after that. The last thing I have for you for the market profile perspective is the fact that value actually did shift slightly slightly higher on the Friday session, as well as the point of control migrated higher with price as well. It's not like an end of the world reversal signal back to the upside, but it is something to note that, uh, again, it's not as bearish as it potentially could have been with value being skewed down here towards the low end of the profile. Once again, if you're not familiar with this, I've got a video for you in the top right-hand corner if you want to learn what those terms and what we're looking at in general are here on the market profile. Without further ado, let's round out the broad market on the QQQ, NASDAQ 100, and then, of course, the Russell. Let me just drop this back down to a reasonable yearly chart. There we go. And taking a quick peek at the cues, a majority of everything we've discussed sentiment wise, as well as psychological wise from the spy will carry forward to the QQQ here. Notice that on Friday's session, we fail and don't really get any acceptance inside of the initial balance range right here. So if it were a look below and fail, we should have closed above that 274.50. If it happens early on in the week, maybe there's reason to believe we head back higher into this level, which I would also have on your charts, by the way, that's 282.20, 282.25 if you'd like, which was the bottom of the initial gap before we started filling it from the FOMC. Also breaching and closed underneath the prior weekly expected move low. The expected move low this week is going to roughly coincide with 261. So if we get a two bar breakdown in here, that's the area that you should start to pay attention to. The number for the weekly expected move low is roughly around 263.25, uh, you know, a couple bucks away from that 261. Maybe I should grab a couple more years actually, so I can show you where 261 is coming from. Zooming in on this section of the chart, here's your 261, right? Week level from here, also prior resistance from around in here. And then after that, if everything just kind of hits the fan, 251 is prior resistance, break, retest, and go. Haven't tested it since. So that's what the levels are underneath us. Zooming back on over to where we're at here. Again, if there's any sort of upward lift early on in the week, this sort of area starts to become a resistant point where you can start saying, okay, it's just kind of keeping us in bear flag consolidation for now. I'm not overly bullish, not overly bullish. If we were to do something like this in that higher low above this gap from in here, that starts to become a little bit more... Um, you know, promising for upside, but obviously that's a bit of a stretch and pure speculation at this point in time. The weekly gap, because we talked about the SPY weekly gap, is technically here and much more of it filled in the QQQ, but the numbers, just as a reference point here, are 286.88 on the bottom end, and the top end to close the gap is 288.42. Let's continue along and get into our IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps. What do we see here underneath us as the chart was uh, zoomed out? Actually, let me point this out. We have a gap right from in the past between one 157.58 and 155.80, which are coinciding roughly with the low end of the weekly expected move. So carry those levels forward as important if we can uh, continue to see a breakdown. I do think that the buyers are incredibly weak here. And the reason being, if we just adjust this chart, so it's a little easier on the eyes, bear with me. Thank you very much is that we, again, inverted hammer on the Friday session, inside bar on the Friday session. If we take out the lows here, boom, that's kind of a, it's not quite a double. I suppose it's actually pretty darn close, uh, a doubling of that range, right? So it would certainly seem well within reach to get there in the IWM if we see continued breakdown. If there's upside, it's gotta be a recapture of 169, obviously because that's the low end of the three-day balance here, and we reject there on Thursday, can't even get close to it on the Friday session, and nonetheless pull back anyways. So anything that breaks out above that, I would just start looking for the midpoint of the three-day balance and the top end of the weekly expected move around 172. Remembering that we use uh, the IWM as more of like a risk-on, risk-off proxy, I would say that the chart is clearly with the new lower low, right, that was put in from here 
to here, still in, or not still, but moving more firmly into aggressive risk off mode, as opposed to the uh, old look, which in here was starting to signal some sort of risk on, right? Obviously all of that has been deteriorated and the market is back down in sort of, hey, heads up kind of look into the upcoming week. So that's been the broad market. Let's get into these companies. If you've made it to this point in the video, I'm sure you're enjoying the analysis. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so you know every single time a new video comes out. And with that, let's get right into Apple. We'll breeze through these companies since I know we spent a lot of time on the broad market. Apple is going to be very similar to the SPY and the Qs here. Obviously, a failure from the buyers here as we close the gap overhead and a failure on Friday or just lack of serious buying anyways. With the, uh, If you look at this right as a look below and fail, why did we not close above that 131.50? Instead, we've closed right on it, which strikes me as a bearish implication. Remember, that that's the lows from in here. So overall, I think that it does want to kind of move lower here, drift lower based on the lack of any serious buying pressure. If it were to be bullish, you'd watch for five or 15 minute acceptance patterns above 131.50 to rotate back higher into 135.15 as an upside target. We'll keep you updated on Wednesday if there are any major changes there. What do we have going on inside of Netflix? Zooming in on this chart. Where's the zoom tool? There we go. Uh, pretty hideous just in terms of the structure that's unfolding here. Pretty tough to trade as we're stuck inside side of the Wednesday bars range. Again, I think that the buyers are sort of lackluster here. Obviously, as we thrust above that Thursday high, zero acceptance with a close back down underneath 176.50. And to me, I would start to again, look for this to move lower. I think the more tactful entry is waiting for this to turn into an H pattern breakdown from these lows here at 165 does start to take us lower. We don't have any supports mapped out for us. So I would just look for continuation into sort of the abyss, if you will, noting that Netflix is moving into really, really old historic levels to the upside the only long trade here is waiting and being patient for this gap trade overhead 185.72 up to 192.22. Not sure it's uh, going to be in play early on in the week. Just noting, oh, there's a little reminder that the market's closed on Monday. Uh, the structure of the candle that we saw on the Friday session, right, really doesn't look likely that the buyers are going to put on an impressive show, get us here, and then do something like that into the week. So next up, we've got Tesla. What's going on in Tessie? Uh, H pattern, right? If I actually zoom this back out for a second, here's your sort of H. We got the dead cat bounce. It resisted right at 700 as we had been talking about for quite some time, right? Here was the inverted head and shoulders, broke that sort of shoulder mark, bounce, break and retest at 700. Now we're back down at the lows inside bar on Friday. So your short is underneath 625 to get you closer to 550. Longs are going to be patient for anything that does this and form a higher low above 700. Don't get me wrong. Five or 15 minute pattern scalps in between in this kind of range right here are fine. But for the better structural long, we of course want to see a higher low above 700. Ironically enough, that would start to put into play something that would do this, right? Another inverted head and shoulders, or you could just simply look at this as a range price acceptance in the upper half. Half, maybe then your entry is something up and over 780, 75. Overall, again, fairly skeptical of longs at this point in time, given the failures that we've discussed around 700. And instead, H pattern sort of setting up the more, uh, you know, favorable breakdown underneath 625 to move into that lower target. Next up, we've got AMD, what's happening in the chip space. So nice hammer candle on the Friday session. This is exactly what we want to see for a daily buy setup. And this is not a buy as in like this is reversing all the way back up to 110. This is a buy as in a quick scalp over the the hammer high into 85 for a back test of the breakdown of this overall range, right? We've fallen off of a cliff. We've moved from a, remember this, right? So we had a range in place, look above and fail. Target's always the bottom end of the range, but we've extended further than that. And we even made a new lower low on the Friday session. So if the uh, sellers, excuse me, are going to be tired and sort of, you know, throw in the towel here in the short term, at least there could be a quick and snappy move over the Friday hammer high for the back test of 85. That would be a scalp on a day trade and then you trail stop higher to see if there's any acceptance back within this range from right here. Anything that re uh, rejects at 85 obviously is a break retest, another H pattern here, and we're looking for lower after that. So again, in the short term, possibility for a quick uh, bullish trade here, but really reevaluating the chart as and if we come into 85 in the first place. Next up, we've got Meta, which is of course the old FB. What's going on here? Two-day balance in play on the Thursday and Friday session. So you're being patient quite simply in this one for a break up and over 165.58 to get us to the bottom of the gap once again, that's 172.56, or downside break underneath the two-day lows, 159.67, get us to 153, right? If we just take a quick peek on the 30-minute time frame, here's sort of your range that we're playing with. The reason that the top is so important is because that's the pullback low from the FOMC, right? So if we break that and then do something like that, that's your bullish trade, and obviously to the downside, something here obviously triggers your short, 159.67. It is a flush point. Notice how exact those lows are. Remember, 
that we never want to see lows exact like this, which is also uh, just to sort of tie this full circle why AMD is more attractive, right? AMD made the lower low. It cleaned up that area and then it snapped back. That's why we're looking for the uh, long over the hammer high. Meta obviously doesn't have that. We have all of these mechanical levels. So if we come back down and test it, I would imagine that breaks again. 153 is the look for lower. Next up, we've got NVIDIA. I know we're moving quite quickly, but hopefully you're sticking with me through it. And then we'll get you those quick three trade ideas and send you on your way for the long weekend here. What's going on inside of NVIDIA? Notice that we have a fairly still mechanical and weak level. I would not put too much faith into the 155 support here, although we did print a green hammer candle. Uh, again, I think if this area is revisited, it probably shouldn't hold up on further tests. Now, don't get me wrong. The buy setup is there up and over the hammer highs at 159.50 should spur an up move here closer to 168.62. And that's where we would reevaluate the charts once again, remembering that also would form something like this potentially in the future. And that's where that breakdown of the 155.50 becomes more attractive. We would give you a downside target after that. Let's uh, let's actually find one together, just in case the market does move lower here early on in the week inside of NVIDIA. I don't want you to be lost to the downside looking out for next supports. So what do we have? It's gotta be underneath that level in here. So zooming in, I would start to call this one out certainly because it is a daily gap that remains unfilled and prior support and resistance from here, 147.65, or excuse me, 147.85 is is roughly the area that you should be looking for if 155.50 gives out to the downside early on in the week. But again, we will update you on the Wednesday session. Next up, we've got Microsoft. What's happening in Softy? Again, perhaps best illustrated on the 30-minute time frame. but look at the failure on the Friday session to get any acceptance inside of the FOMC day or above the Thursday indecision doji high. There was a slight in, uh, uptick in volume, but that was across the board. And the close here strikes me as fairly weak. So I would use 247.50 as a pivot because we've closed right on it. Be a little patient on the Tuesday morning open. If we're above, maybe there's reason to believe we head back towards 250-250. If we're below, I would start watching out and being cognizant of 239 on the downside. Here's the 30 minute look and why that is so important. Let's zoom in on this actually. There we go. Uh, again, you can just kind of see resistance, support, support from the FOMC rally. Again, making that such an important level. Here's your Thursday highs. And we sort of close right on it on the Friday session instead of remaining high and tight in this bull flag consolidation, kind of a failure in my perspective from the buyers. Last but not least, the mini beast, we've got Amazon back over to the daily time frame. Again, weak levels down at the lows. Carry this forward as something that should break in the future if we retest it here at 102.61. All of these levels are exact. That's usually not how significant bottoms are put into place. Don't get me wrong, this has a much stronger close from the Friday session, looking like we could continue here into 109 from the gap fill area early on in the week because of the strength that we exhibited into the close on the Friday session. So this is really much more of a better indication for upside. Um, so let's see, if there's if there's a long to be had early on in the week, the broad market's moving higher, Amazon would probably be a name that I would look at just based on the relative strength here. That's our first target. Anything after that really comes into this gap here um, from sort of the post split debacle when things kind of fell apart. Part, right? That's going to be 114 up to 116.12. That's all I've got for you in the core list of companies. I'll send us off with our three trade ideas. Let's get into them. Quick reminder to hit the thumbs up button, the subscribe button, the bell button, all of those buttons, and also indicate some interest or not for the shirts in the YouTube poll. Without further ado, first trade idea is going to be on Walmart. Four day lows in place at 118. If it breaks down, we have this low to be targeting here at 117.27. I'd call it 117 even. So a quick snappy dollar move could easily take place over the course of a five minute intraday candle and from there monitor for continuation to the downside because we're moving into fairly uncharted territories. So just use a trade stop as we start to get into that area. Next up, and by the way, not interested in the trade if we breach 121 with candle prints to the upside. Next up, we've got TSM for Taiwan Semiconductor. What's happening in this one? Two-day balance is in play here, but the reason it's so attractive as a trade setup is because we have a clear target if it breaks to the upside, the gap fill from in here. So up and over 86 into 87.41. And to the downside, two back-to-back -back equal lows. Again, it's a weak level on the chart. If that breaks down, so underneath 84, the target is here at 82.52 which was a significant resistance off to the left and could potentially offer some support when tested from the top side down. Last but not least, ELY, Callaway Golf. What's happening in this one? Taking a quick peek here, a little bit of relative strength over the last couple of weeks here, forming a new budding uptrend. So higher lows are in place, but certainly let's acknowledge the long-term downtrend that it is certainly in. So two ways to trade this one. Number one would be that you're aggressive. You're looking for this little uptrend to continue into the resistance trend line. You would be looking for this move, right? The reason that that could be in store is because we have a uh, big green volume bar and also a big green 
candle bar on the Friday session, closing above a red candle high. So a little bit of upward lift wouldn't seem unreasonable here inside of ELY. So you could trade for the bullish move into the resistance trend line, or you could be patient and wait for any potential topping signals in here. So inverted hammer, short the lows, and then retarget the support trend line underneath and potentially monitor for continuation for the downward channel to remain intact and potentially come into the low end here. So a couple of ways to look at this one, but again, interesting looking chart with such a well-defined channel and new uptrend starting with an interesting close on the Friday session. That's going to wrap it up for today's video. If you learned anything new, feel free to let me know down below in the comments section or by giving the video a thumbs up. Please again, indicate some interest or not for the shirt so I can order the correct amount. And with that being said, I wish you all a green trading week.